I've only discovered your channel maybe a couple of months ago and I've been binging your content, but you have for quite a time quite a while been laser focused on the problems with Russia and specifically Vladimir Putin. Uh, potentially the video that you made that I've enjoyed the most so far is contrasting the difference between old Soviet propaganda and the, the new style of Putin propaganda coming out of Moscow. For our audience who haven't seen that video, can you explain the difference between uh, Kremlin propaganda 30, 40 years ago and Kremlin propaganda today? It's quite a basic um, difference. Soviet propaganda tried to persuade you of an alternate picture of reality, tried to paint a world and invited you to believe in it. Now, at the very end of the Soviet project, nobody could believe in it. So it was a kind of a game. Um, but the idea was still that there was some kind of ideological vision and that was the right thing to believe in. When I was at school, I had to say how much I loved Lenin. I loved Lenin more than my relatives. So that was the story. They were trying to persuade you of a kind of um, fantasy, historical fantasy of deliverance from social and economic problems via Marxist-Leninism. Putinist propaganda doesn't try to persuade you of an alternate reality that you should believe in. It tries to manipulate your sense of reality. It basically tries to saturate the informational environment with incompatible pictures of reality. And the aim isn't to persuade you of anything, isn't to initiate you into kind of political mobilization, into kind of vision. The aim is to depoliticize you, to make you feel, well, this is too complex for me to engage in, and make you feel that maybe there isn't such a thing as an unqualifiedly statable truth about anything. Soviet propaganda was clear. This is the truth. And if you don't believe in that, you're wrong. Putin propaganda does not try to tell you, we have the story here. This is what you believe. Putin propaganda tries to tell you, look, this is a very complex world and there are claims and counterclaims. And then it tries to pump information at you from all directions. And the idea is that you simply give up on politics. That's the key aspiration. And it's been working very tragically, effectively. Um, until a few days ago, when the first issue ever in my experience came up, on which the propaganda began to splatter, and that's mobilization. Because they were trying to saturate the informational environment with incompatible messages about mobilization. And normally, that would sort of confuse and pacify people. But on this occasion, it sounded to people like, you're going to take us away and we're going to die, or you're not going to take us away, we're not going to die. We're going to die, we're not going to die. So, so it did the opposite. It actually uh, made people anxious and made people feel the opposite to the feeling that was desired, which is to get them to retire to the couch. But that doesn't mean the machine has cracked. The propaganda machine is still intact. It's just had a wobble. As, as an American, I think I've felt this uh, increase in confusion and chaos, especially since 2014, after Putin annexed Crimea, the first round of sanctions were put on Russia. I think it's at that point in 2014 that Putin had already decided he was going for all of Ukraine. Uh, they were holding these exercises on the border every year, amassing hundreds of thousands of soldiers, war gaming, prepping, uh, Peace was never an option. Putin, in my opinion, was always going for Kyiv. They wanted control of the whole country. So with this increase in this new style of confusion, this propaganda coming out of the Kremlin, what should Western governments and Western media be doing? How should they be uh, responding to it that maybe they're not doing effectively up until this point? Well, I think the first thing is to first of all, understand that it's real and try to understand how it works, but also try to see it for what it is, um, not make it bigger than it is. I think that since 2014, in a very 
self-conscious way, it's been Russian foreign policy to destabilize democracies that were participating in the sanctions regime against Russia. And destabilization was the aim. Chaos was the aim. Loss of trust, loss of faith in democracy was the aim. The aim has never been to take sides. Um, so it, it's important to understand that um, it, it's completely devoid of loyalty, this sort of Russian intervention. If it fits them to go for Le Pen or uh, Trump for a few weeks, they will do that. If it then fits them to go for Biden, indeed, for some bizarre reason, they will do that too. So we shouldn't think too much of Russians as being sort of tied to and supporting ongoingly political, particular political candidates. Um, although sometimes they would support somebody for a period of months, but that can always change. I think that short of dealing with what they're up to technically, there's a kind of important political lesson about how we should respond. And that's about understanding what their main sort of goal is. And the goal is probably that we freak out about their interference. And so what I like to say is that the point of the interference isn't so that the interference does damage to us, but that so, so that it seeds panic, conflict, and confusion. And that, our reaction to interference, is then what damages our democracy. So my advice around this is to do the opposite of what we're often doing, which is to try to depoliticize our way of understanding Russian interference in our societies. And that's really, really very difficult for us to do because we have got culture wars in the West between folks who play down Russian interference and indeed even say that it's not real and folks who take a very maximalist view of it, which may exaggerate its role and harm us that way too, because the effect of that often is that we forget that some of the problems we're dealing with are homegrown. And that's an important point too. The Russians rarely try to seed completely new problems. They pay attention to what already divides us and then try to maximize that. So that's a kind of a the beginning of a conversation, I think, about how we, we talk about responding to the way they've, they've been interfering and the way they're going to try to continue interfering in our democracies. I mean, we don't want to say, basically, that everything that's wrong with our democracy is an expression of malign foreign interference on the one hand. On the other hand, we want to acknowledge interference when it's real and we want to respond to it and protect ourselves from it. And above all, we want to not let it divide us. And that's a very difficult challenge.